Welcome everyone this morning. Um, I've seen this little slideshow going on that, that uh, probably went in a little bit late into the evening. I was noticing that with the young people down there in my classroom. I said, boy, they, they either missed some sleep or they haven't never gone to sleep. Boy, they were wild today. So. <laughs> they, they kept me hopping this morning. So. But uh, anyway, we're glad you're all here. Uh, don't really have a lot of announcements. Uh, two weeks we have the potluck and uh, the graduation for our, our high school seniors, <coughs> college graduates. So um, that's coming along. We're uh, about ready for them to head out for school, and, and we're going to finally finally get them. So uh, glad to have everyone here, and uh, hope your time is well spent here. We will always be hospitable. Yes. <coughs> Shall we open prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together to praise you, to grow in our knowledge of you, to grow closer together under your guidance. We ask that we worship you in spirit and truth, and that you work in our hearts today, that we can touch others' lives with your word, and our lives be affected by what we hear today. Just grant us the open hearts and ready minds to receive your word and carry it to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> Let's stand and sing number 226. <laughs>
hearts and minds for the Lord's Supper, number 382. Why did my Savior come to earth? passed away on June 23rd, and uh, just, uh, I just, Desiree and I both wanted to say thank you for just the, the, the outpouring of, of love that we felt um, during that time and, and after. Um, got a lovely plant, I'm sure that Kim coordinated, a beautiful peace lily that's still blooming and looks lovely in our home. Um, not all of you knew my mom. She was a member here, but it had been a number of years um, that she had been pretty much housebound, and so she hadn't been able to go out. And uh, it was in kind of late May that, that in, in consultation with our family doctor that we decided it was appropriate for her, and she had decided it was appropriate for her to go into hospice. And so we admitted her on May 30th to hospice in home. She lived with us for the last 12 years. And so what was startling about that was the, the, the for me at least, what was startling was The rapid pace of her decline in in the subsequent three weeks, and uh, you know it was a blessing to be able to go through that with her. It really was because she and I got some time together to you know just talk and resolve some things that kids always have to resolve with their parents, and parents with their kids. Um, but she did start to go through a, a pretty severe physical and cognitive decline after May thirtieth. And so, um, 
Mom became a Christian shortly after I did, back in the, I guess, late 70s, maybe early 80s for her. And she always struggled with her faith. She was a child of a depression and, and uh, had some really rough family times. And she always struggled with her faith in the sense that she never felt like she was doing enough. So she struggled with that concept of a works-based salvation that, you know, if you just try harder, God will be more pleased. And we would talk about it. And it was just always a, a burden for her and, and to really get grace, the concept of grace, really internalized. And I don't know that she ever did, maybe toward the end, but I remember one, I want you all to know. Sorry. Sorry, brother. Sorry. It's about you. That for her, you were always the best understanding she had of grace. And in the last week, she was really struggling to talk and to get her thoughts out. And one of the last things she said to me before she really kind of stopped being able to verbalize. <sighs> so tell her paragraphs how much I love them. Mm -hmm. So she knew grace through you. I wanted you all to know that. It's important for you to know that. Um, she went peacefully the last few days. She she had pretty much probably, you know, I don't know if it was a coma, but she was obviously. And I was, Lauren had been there, and we'd all been holding her hand that night, and everybody had gone to bed, and I was actually laying in bed with her holding her hand when she went. And uh, it was just a wonderful blessing you know, to have that time with her. But I wanted you all to know how grateful we are for the, the love and the grace that you showed our family, and then you especially showed mom. And uh, I know she went peacefully, and to a great degree, was because of <laughs> all of you. <laughs> so you'll never know how much that <laughs> means to me. All right. Deep breath. Enough of that. Enough for what I'm up here for. Um, you know, we're reminded about that fellowship and about, you know, we come together and we're reminded just the number of reasons we do this together. And I was reflecting on um, Psalms 37. I just want to read a few verses out of Psalms 37. I'll start in verse 3. And this is a Psalm of David. He said, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, and trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth Thy righteousness is the light, and thy judgment is the noonday. And rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself, because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. If you go back, he says four things. He says to trust in the Lord, to delight in the Lord, to commit thy way unto the Lord, and then to the rest in the Lord. And I, those words are just so comforting for me to right now, because we've been in so much turmoil both external and internal, you know, internal in the family, what I just described, but all the stuff that's going on externally, I'm still working from home, and, you know, we've still got pretty much the office shut down at work, and trying to deal with all this COVID stuff as a leader at work, and I've just felt, I don't know if you have, but I've felt off balance just by everything that's going on. It's the best way to describe it is I've just felt off balance from what my normal is, and I'm normally pretty composed. I think you know me well enough to I don't shake, e you know, easily, but I've been shaken up by the stuff that's been going on. But the thought that I can trust, that I can delight, that I can commit, and that I can rest has felt good. It just feels like this is a reminder that that's what we do with and for one another. And so hopefully you can just take that and be a blessing to you. Um, let's bow together. Gracious Father, we're so grateful be together. Yes, <clears throat> you know, gratitude is one of the things that you give us that's such a blessing when we're able to recognize 
recognize it and, and bring it into our lives and just have just a spirit of gratitude. Gratitude for you and for one another, and especially right now for what your son did for us. I think we take it for granted, Father, that we it's so far away in, in, in history that it's hard for us to really imagine what it was like and what he actually did. And we just ask that you would bring that forth in our minds, just an appreciation for the level of sacrifice and and to bring a sense of gratitude this morning as we remember his body that was sacrificed on our behalf, that hung on a cruel cross, but was never broken, according to scripture, but was horribly abused, and all done for us that we might have a relationship with you through him. It's your sons that we pray. Amen. 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 Father, we come again that we know that uh, since the beginning that blood has been such an important part of your relationship with your children and that, that it represents just a, a cleansing as we approach you. And we're so grateful, Father, for the lamb that you gave us the once and for all sacrifice that you provided to us and that blood that was shed on our behalf. And today we remember that with the spirit of the vine and we, we just call to our memory and, and to our heart's gratitude for that sacrifice. It's just something we pray. I do want to thank you all for your patience and for indulging me for that. And it was a little bit different for a Lord's Supper talk. Um, Bless you, brother. The uh, contribution is in the back, so we're still not passing. It's just back there on the little um, shelf. And so just feel free to drop your contribution as you leave. I'll collect it and get it all deposited. But um, let's go ahead and offer up a prayer for that as well, if you could. Father, again, and we just we come mindful of the material blessings that you give us in our lives and just how bountiful they are. Sometimes again, Father, we forget that we are just the, just so richly blessed. And uh, to remember that we're stewards, that it is all owned by you, and that we just would ask to be good stewards, faithful stewards, Father. We, uh, regret, we're grateful for the leadership here and, and their heart towards serving you and expanding your influence in this community and throughout the world. We ask that this, these funds would be, continue to be committed to doing that. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Next song is going to be number 753. <coughs> 
Heavenly Father, we're humbled to be able to come before you at this time to worship you and in spirit and in truth as you have commanded us. Let's all clear our minds. Let us all realize that you are the audience and the only one worthy of our praise. Father, let us all meditate on this, this fact as we go forward. Father, we ask that you uh, uh, be with the one who has led us in singing this morning, all of those who participate in uh, serving during this service, and we ask that you uh, bless the one that will bring us the lesson uh, in a few moments. Let us listen attentively. Let us take those things to heart from your word, apply them, and take them with us outside of these walls. Dear Lord, we're reminded what a place of solace this is, coming together with those of like precious faith. But we're also reminded how sometimes difficult it is when we walk outside of these doors. Father, we ask that you give each of us boldness, stick to itiveness, firmness when it comes to the things we know from your word. Let us share those things with others. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for you and us being part of your creation, being created in your image. We're also most thankful for the plan you put and put in place from the foundations of the world to redeem us from sin. And how amazing it is that plan included your son, the one who created us, that he would leave your right hand come to this earth and put on flesh just like us and be subject to us and look what we did yet he knew that would happen and he did it willingly and he did it for us in spite of us <coughs> Father let us all be eternally grateful for that fact and because of that fact we can lift our heads high, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Christ did for us and how he is that connection between us and you. Father, let us ever be thankful for this and all the blessings that you give us, which you bestow on us bountifully, each one of us in different ways and in different measures, but we all are blessed to be in Christ. Yes. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Poor Dave didn't think I showed up. <laughs> Let's stand for this uh, reading of scripture this morning, please. Our readings from uh, John 11, uh, 37 through 45. 20 through 27. Pardon? 11, 20 through 27. 11, 20 through 27. Thank you. 1120 through 27. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who believes and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Amen. 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 For Abel. Remain standing for our uh, song for the lesson number 414. <clears throat> anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Jesus. 
Good morning, Fairgrounds. Good morning. How you feel today? Wonderful. Wonderful. Awesome, you said, right? Glad to hear that. Glad to hear it. So glad to be with you this morning, as I always am. I count it a privilege and a pleasure to be able to come and to worship with the saints at the Fairgrounds Road Church of Christ, where we worship God in spirit and in truth. And if you happen to be visiting with us this morning, we are wonderfully glad that God has directed your footsteps to 290 Fairgrounds Road. Amen. We appreciate you being here, and we just want you to know that whenever you're at Fairgrounds, you are at home. So we welcome you home. We hope, trust, and pray that there will be something that is said today uh, that would move you uh, to improve and enhance and increase your relationship with God. And if for any reason you have not named the name of Christ yet, if for any reason you have not become a member of the body of Christ yet, we want you to know that you have a wonderful opportunity to do so this day. Amen. We encourage you not to leave this building this day without being within the protection of the family of God. And we'll tell you more about that a little bit later. Today I'd like to thank all of you for praying for my family. I shared with you a couple of weeks ago that my sister... Uh, had been overtaken by the COVID-19 disease, and uh, there are a number of things that she went through that made it seem like it was touch and go for a minute, but uh, she is proclaiming victory over said disease now, having been cleared by her doctors, and now she is an evangelist uh, for all of the things that she did to deal with it, whether it's um, being up and active and moving around, or the organic foods and supplements that she took, uh, but most most, most importantly, uh, she feels as though God has dealt with her and given her an opportunity. And she is absolutely dedicated to improving her relationship with him and to increasing and improving her walk. And so that's what it takes to get my little sister <laughs> to get her house in order and praise God for COVID. Uh, not that we want to see anyone lose their lives because on the same day that she was cleared, um, the person who introduced me to the church uh, came down with it, her and her daughter. Karen and uh, Gigi Camp uh, are now dealing with that as well. So I would ask you to continue to pray for them and for all of those who have been impacted by this terrible disease. I want to make sure that we keep Cinda uh, and her family in our prayers. I shared during class this morning that uh, her mom was scheduled to go into a convalescent facility and uh, it was having a terrible, terrible effect on her father, Bob Massey. Uh, and then it was determined that the facility would not be able to take any new people because a new diagnosis of COVID had been discovered there. So that kind of threw the whole thing into turmoil and undid a lot of the work that they had done to prepare their father for this. And it's just a tough, tough situation. And so let us be sure uh, to keep Cinda and all of her family uh, and everyone involved in that situation in our prayers and just pray that God will work things out and work things through. Um, heart goes out to Kevin and his family this morning uh, with his heartfelt words about his mom and Memorial. And uh, we just continue to love you and support you, Kevin, and, and your entire family. And we know that you miss mom, but we know that she is um, enjoying the place prepared for her. Right. So we want to continue to keep you in prayer. And though most of us are back, there are some of us who are still at home uh, because of the decisions that they've made to remain safe. And we certainly honor that. And uh, the one person that comes to mind in particular to me this morning is our dear Sandy. Sandy, we all miss you, and we look forward to the time that you can be back here with us. Uh, but Sandy's devout. I mean, every time we have a broadcast going on on Facebook, she's there. Whether it's uh, the, the days of encouragement, the weekly encouragement, the services, the classes, she's there. Uh, so she is still a strong, strong member of this family and strongly missed. And so uh, we continue to be in prayer for you and look forward to the time that we can all worship again together. Right. All right. This morning, I have a no to low fuss message for you. <laughs> you know, I had the opportunity of preaching at another congregation, and I had a member walk up to me, and she said, Brother Lewis, are you going to fuss at us this morning? Are you, are you going to spank us? And I said, I. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle? <laughs> Uh, and she says, yeah, you're one of those spanking preachers. I said, listen, I just share the word of God with you, and if you feel spanked, then you work that out with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but I was looking at the message this morning, and, and, and so this is a no, a, no, a no to low spank message, so uh, hopefully you will be encouraged, educated, and edified by those things that uh, God 
is providing with us. Over the last few weeks, family, we have been talking uh, about the sources, the sources of faith. And we've talked about faith that came from experience. We've talked about faith that came from witness. And so we've got yet another installment of that sub uh, theme for us today. So I would share with you that as we endeavor, family, to increase our faith, it is important that we reach back to these sources in order to discover them in present day. We need to be able to go to the Word of God, examine what the Word of God says, take a look at the principles, and then apply them to our day-to-day -day lives, with how we interact with one another, how we interact with the world, and how we interact with our God. And so today, for inspiration, let us consider the case of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Is that all right? You don't have time for that this morning? Yes. Yeah. All right. All right. So meet me, if you would, at John chapter 11, verse 37. John chapter 11, verse 37. Now, what we will find here is that Jesus has come to the place where his friends Mary and Martha reside, where his friend Lazarus is buried. And there are those who are with them because of the occasion of the passing of Lazarus. And so the story picks up there from the scripture that was so capably read in your hearing this morning that some of them who were present said, could not this man, Jesus, who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now, it was a cave, and there was a stone that was lying in front of the opening of that cave. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time, there will be a stone for he has been dead some four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always Hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe, so that they may believe, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrapping. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Jesus said, take off those grave clothes. Loose him and let him go. Amen. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus had done. Oh Lord, we pray. Oh Lord, we pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the divinity of it. We thank you for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for those men utilized to record it for our uses even this day. We know that the word cannot possibly contain you, O oh God, but we know that it contains everything that we need to know about you, O oh God. And we thank you for sharing this information from your love, from your compassion, from your grace and your mercy that we might know our creator, that we might know our father that we might know your will and your way for our lives. Father, we pray this morning that as we examine that word, that we find you in it, that we find ourselves in you, Father, 
and that we apply ourselves to the word even as we apply the word to ourselves. That we may be, Father, not just forgetful hearers, but doers of your divinely inspired word. Amen. We thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Family, this morning, let us consider faith from the miraculous. Is that all right? Yes. Faith from the miraculous. We, we've talked about how David had experience with God as a shepherd boy who empowered him to defeat the lions and the bears who would remove the sheep from his care. Uh, we talked about how Thomas, having witnessed Jesus come back from the dead, present himself for consideration, found faith in what he saw. Today, family, there is a miracle that has occurred. One has been brought back from death to life. And as a result, faith has been established. Faith has been born. There are many sources of faith. Why people would turn themselves to God. Why people would become followers of Jesus Christ. But today, we take a look at a miracle that happened that had the desired effect. Now, I want you to know that I know that you know the story of Lazarus being brought from the dead. I pray you do. I pray you heard of it at some point in your life. And perhaps you've even heard a sermon or two about it. But, but I assure you today that we're going to take a different look at this passage of Scripture. Because the point is not the raising of Lazarus per se, but the effect of of the raising of Lazarus. Is that all right? Yes. Uh, I guarantee you, family, that I'm not going to deviate from the accuracy or the intent of the scripture. We're just going to pursue uh, uh, an alternative viewpoint. We're, we're going to look at it from a different perspective. Same facts, same Bible, same God, same Holy Spirit inspiration, but a different look in order that we may extract from it and understanding about faith. Is that all right? Yes. And, and so as we go through this, family, I'd like for us to, again, uh, to examine the occasion of Lazarus' death, the opportunity that his death presented, and the outcome of him being called from the dead. If you've got just a minute for this, let me know. All right. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So let's talk about this occasion. Let's talk about this occasion. We find and we understand and we know that Lazarus was a good friend of Jesus's. In fact, Jesus was friends with Mary, uh, Martha and Lazarus, three siblings who lived in the town of Bethany. He was aware of them. Uh, he knew them and he loved them. We don't know the whole story about how he came to meet them and those kinds of things. We see different interactions between them in different places within the scriptures, within the gospel writing. Uh, but as far as where they met and when they met and how they met and how they struck it, we don't know all of that. We just take it from what the Bible tells us is that they knew one another and they loved one another. We also know that at some point Lazarus became sick. He became down in his health. He became threatened in his ability to continue to live. And Jesus, as he was going about his business with his apostles, uh, uh, was given the information from Martha. She sent word to him saying, Jesus, uh, the one who you love, Lazarus, is sick. Now, Martha was not just communicating to him latest information. There was an implied desire on her part, an implied request on her part that Jesus would come and see about his friend. Why would she want Jesus to come and see about his friend? Not just to, 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 to visit him in the hospital, not just to bring him flowers, not just to give him a teddy bear that says get well soon. No, this is the son of God. And if there's anyone that can do something about his illness, it is Jesus. So she sent word to Jesus, the friend that you have and that you love is sick. Are y'all on the line this morning? Uh, uh, and so Jesus receives the report that Lazarus is sick. However, he does not do what you might ordinarily expect from him to do. He does not do what Martha might have thought that he would do. Because what we know from the Holy Writ is that he delays. Right. Watch this. He gets 
gets word that his friend is sick and he does not move toward where his friend is. He stays where he is located. Now, that's a bit counterintuitive. And one might wonder why on earth Jesus would delay going to his side. Why on earth would Jesus, who had the power of healing, the power of life, the power of everything, not go and apply that power to his friend's situation? Well, uh, I'm so glad that you asked because it turns out that there was a plan. Now, we don't know what that plan was, nor did those who were with him. And so Jesus begins to share some information with him. In verse 4 of the chapter, the Bible says, but when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he says, listen, to those who are with him, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. I want to repeat that for you in case you missed it. One, he says, this is not a sickness that's going to lead to death. Two, he says, uh, there's something that's going to happen here that's going to end in the glorification of God. And three, there's going to be verification that the Son of God is also going to be glorified. You see, that's the plan. What we see is that Jesus had discovered that there uh, is an occasion by which God can be glorified. Family, I, I just hope, trust, and pray that we always have our spiritual antenna tuned to the things that are going on around us, the people who are moving about around us for an opportunity to glorify God. We ought to be looking for opportunities to glorify God. Something that we say, something that we do, something that we give that can glorify God is what we ought to be focused on throughout the days of our lives. Wherever we are at any time doing anything, we should be looking to glorify God. Now, that wasn't fussing, was it? No? Okay, good. All right, just checking. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So, now, from here, we see that Lazarus does indeed pass from this life. Lazarus succumbs to his sickness. Lazarus ends up giving up the ghost, as the saying may be uttered. Uh, well, wait a minute. Jesus says that this is a sickness, not, it's not going to end in death. Yet, a death has occurred. Is that Andrew, one of the alleged Bible contradictions that people talk about. Oh, I submit to you that it is not. Uh, because it doesn't end in his death. Not in the traditional understanding of what we mean by that. Nevertheless, nevertheless, he says this to his apostles in verse 11. Uh, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. Did you get that? Now, we know that he has died. Jesus speaks in terms of sleep. Oh, I wonder about why that situation exists. Why does Jesus use that terminology? Now, we could speculate about that, but it's going to turn out that we don't need to speculate about it. But what happens, though, it confuses his apostles. Well, wait a minute. If he's just sleep, wait, he'll wake up. That's what happens when you go to sleep. And so Jesus then has to break it down to them in verse 14, where the Bible says that Jesus says plainly, Lazarus is dead. So he acknowledges within himself, he knew, he acknowledges to the apostles that he has died. Now let's remember that he had the information that he was sick, had he had time to get to him, but lingered, hung about, stayed put until such time as Lazarus died. And now he's saying the death has occurred. Verse 15, and I am glad, watch this, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. You get your cameras ready? So that you may believe. So that you may believe, but let us go to him. 
Now, see, that tells us something about the plan right now. It, it, it says something, family, that Lazarus dying has something to do with our ability to believe. Lazarus dying has something to do with our faith. Lazarus dying has something to do with the Fairgrounds Road Church of Christ increasing our faith. Is that all right? Yeah. And so Jesus has all of this in mind. Now, by the time Jesus arrives to where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus live, we are told that he has been dead four days. He has been dead four days. Now, you may or may not know the significance of that, but I'd like to share with you some information about how death was considered in the Jewish community at that time. The idea was such that this could occur in those times. And still in these times in certain countries, when someone dies, the urgent desire is to bury them immediately, the same day. Now, to your horror, I'm sure, you can imagine that there is an occasional instance of someone being buried that's not quite dead. The horror. <laughs> uh, medical science being what it was in those days, there's any number of things that may have caused someone to appear dead. It may have been a coma. It may have just been an extended state of unconsciousness of some sort, but it was not necessarily unusual that people who were buried were not dead. So from this, there began to be the thinking amongst that community in that time, in that land, that if a person was said to have been dead, their spirit hovered near, hung out around the body for three days. And if they were dead any longer than three days, the spirit was not going to be able to hang around for any longer than that, and it would go to wherever it was going. So the tradition, the belief, the understanding of the people was that any time within three days of death, life could still exist. But after that time, they were irrevocably and permanently dead. Is that all right? And so now we see that by the time Jesus gets there, it is four days, which means he is irrevocably and permanently dead. Are, are y'all on the line this morning? Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so Jesus waits until there is no confusion, no controversy, no disagreement that Lazarus has passed from this life until the next life. He's gone. He's wrapped in burial clothing. He is prepared and he is put in a tomb. That is his condition. Now I want you to watch this. Martha has words for Jesus. But not just words for Jesus, but a confession of her own faith. Turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 20, verse 21. John chapter 20, verse 21. We're going to... We're going we're gonna to globe throughout the Bible this morning a little bit, family, so I hope that you are prepared. John chapter 20, verse 21. Again, that was so read, uh, read so capably in your hearing by Armin this morning. Martha then said to Jesus as he has arrived, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And so that tells us a couple of things. One, when I sent you the message, my intent and desire was that you would come and prevent him from having to experience death. Prevent me from having to deal with the loss of my brother. But you did not come and as a result he died. That says a couple of things to us. One, uh, she misses her brother. Uh, two, she, she, she has faith in Jesus. Y'all see her faith? Yes. If you had been here, he would not have died. Now, she also says this. Even now, 
I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Now, we would be speculating to try to determine what she meant by that. I doubt that she meant what happened. But I think it's just another instance and demonstration of her faith. I believe in you, Jesus, and your ability so much that whatever it is you ask for, you can have because God's going to make sure that you get it. Whether that works for me or not in this situation, that goes along with my belief system about who you are. So then Jesus says, your brother will rise again. Here's how we know that she wasn't asking for anything at this point. Martha said to him, I know. I like that. I know. I am supremely confident. Uh, I cannot be dissuaded. I have the knowledge that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. See, he's dead. And every human endeavor says that once somebody is dead dead, then they're dead. And they will not be back. However, my faith and my teaching, my learning from you is that there will be a day, a resurrection day, when all those who have died in Christ will rise again. So I expect to see my brother on that great getting up day, whenever that is. But that is the level of my expectation. Notice her basic but firm faith. Her basic but firm faith. She believes what she believes even in the face of what she's dealing with. I hope, trust and pray that we all have that basic and firm belief. More than basic, but at least that basic and firm belief. Then Jesus says to her, listen, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. I am in. I am a Christian. I am a believer. I believe you with everything I have in me. But you see, she didn't believe everything that there was because she didn't know. She believed as much as she could and she believed as much as she had information about. But Christ is always going to exceed our expectations. That's right. Christ is always going to have more ability than we can imagine that he has. So as firm as she was in her basic belief, she was not ready for what Jesus could and would do. So I believe that Martha is to be commended for her faith. I can't take anything away from her. And I think it was natural for her to kind of confront Jesus and say, if you just had been here, Lord, we'd still have him. But, 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 but it's okay because I know I'm going to see him again one day. And so many of us, family, have been through that. So many of us have. And just imagine her grief. But witness, witness her confidence. That family then leads us to the opportunity. Because as I shared with you in the beginning, there is an opportunity that has presented itself with this entire Lazarus situation. You see, after he has this conversation with Martha, then he asks to see Mary, the sister. They were in two different places. And so Martha leaves Jesus after this exchange and goes to get Martha and says, Jesus is here and he decides to see you. Now, picture the scene that Mary is in the house and she's got all kinds of people who are there in the house with her and for Mary and Martha on the occasion of the passing of their brother. Now, we know what it's like to lose someone and to have a wake. And the folks who love us and love the people who we may have lost will show up and come and sit with us and talk with us and bring food. And it was a situation similar to that. And in that culture, they also had professional mourners. People who were paid to come along and mourn. We, we, it's difficult for us to, to, to identify with that because we don't have that in our culture, but they did in those days. And so just imagine groups of people who are there hanging around, mourning the loss of Lazarus. And, and I want you to know also that the Bible talks about how they were weeping. 
Now, I don't mean that sort of quiet. No, I mean screaming, weeping, being loud and vociferous in their grief expression. Why? Because the louder you were, the more demonstrative you were, the more it says about your relationship with that individual and the honor that you are trying to place upon them by your expression. That's just the way that it was then. So imagine all these moaning and screaming and crying out loud people just hanging around. So when Mary gets the word from Martha that Jesus is here and decides he, he desires to see you, she kind of dashes out. And of course, people notice that she's leaving. And so there's this trail of people screaming and crying and, 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 and wailing, following her until the point that they get to Jesus. So he has this conversation with her. And I want you to see something about the power of God here. Because now, he asked that the stone that was over the tomb be removed. It's Mary who says, Lord, he's been dead four days. And what that means is that there is such a state of decay within the body. It has begun to deteriorate. It has begun to break down. The bacteria have begun to do their job in dismantling it at a cellular level, which means that there is going to be a stench. We all know what dead things smell like. And I don't know if any of us have ever been around a human body. Uh, I, I, I pray that you haven't. And in, in, in this day and age with funeral homes and embalming fluid and all those kinds of things, it is designed that we wouldn't have that experience. But if you've ever been around something of any size that has died, it's a smell that you don't forget. And so this was a further tribute to the deadness of Lazarus. And she says to him, Lord, by now, you're talking about unrolling this stone. We are going to be treated to a waft of nastiness that is going to overwhelm us. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you, Mary, that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So they removed the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes. And began to pray. He prayed to God. He said, Father, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And I know that you always hear me because you and I, we've got a thing. You're my father. I'm your son. We work together. I'm here to carry out your will and your way. So whenever I pray to you, I know that you've got me. I know that you hear me. I know that you stand at the ready. But I'm praying to you now, Father, not for myself, but for all these Wailers that are standing around screaming for, for, for Mary in her anguish, for Martha in her defeat. Father, I'm praying to you on their behalf, and I know that you hear me. You always hear me, uh, but I want these people to know. Well, I want you to know that it's those people who were there. Those people are the opportunity. Their presence is why the death of Lazarus was such an important event. Jesus could at any time have prevented him from dying. But remember what he said to his apostles, that God is going to be glorified. And I will be shown to be his son and I will be glorified as well. Remember that this illness with him is not going to result in death. It's not to say that he won't die. It's to say that he won't stay dead. Y'all get that? Yeah. Now watch this. We know that he died. And we know that Christ called him. You know, I was having a conversation with my brother, Dr. Thomas Jackson. You remember him when he came to talk to us. And he was talking about the difference in resurrection and resuscitation. Resurrection is when we are all going to be called back to life permanently. We know that Lazarus is not still walking around. He was raised from the dead, but eventually he died again. And so it's as if he was resuscitated. You know what cardiopulmonary resuscitation is, where you do. You know what that is, right? Until step, 
right? So we understand somebody being brought back to life from death. And this is what he did. His, this was not yet the resurrection, but the resuscitation. And so Jesus calls that to come to be about. When we talk about this opportunity, we must talk about why it's an opportunity. That opportunity is found in John chapter 20, verse 30, 31, where the Bible says that Jesus did a whole lot of stuff. A whole lot of stuff. Many things. Other signs that Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in the book. Why? These have been written so that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. I, I submit to you, family, that the reason that Jesus allowed sickness to overtake Lazarus was to present an opportunity for you and I and all those who were present and all those who would ever hear the story to believe. Amen. That is the point. That was the opportunity that was given. And so it turns out that there's an outcome. And then the lesson will be yours. Jesus does famously call Lazarus from the grave. Lazarus, he says, come out. And you know, coming up, you hear a lot of these southern preachers, they say, you know, it, it was important that Jesus used Lazarus' name. Because with the resurrection power that he had to just simply say, come out of that grave, that every grave on the planet would have been emptied out. He had to be specific. I'm not talking to all you dead people. I'm talking to Lazarus, the dead person. You come out. All the rest of you, you just wait. <laughs> now, as important as this miracle is, again, it's not about, from our perspective and our conversation this morning, about the power of Christ to Snatch him from the clutches of death. Is that the case? Yes. Is it important? Yes. But from our perspective this morning, I want you to know that this miracle had two different effects. Two different effects. In verse 45, we can see that those who were present, when they saw Lazarus come walking out the grave, still wrapped in the bindings that they had placed on him, Hearing Jesus say, take those grave, those grave clothes off him, loose him, the Bible says they believed. They believed in Jesus. They, 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 they said, I've never seen anything like this. I've never heard of anything like this. This Jesus just spoke to a grave and a formerly dead person, dead more than four days, came walking out. I don't know what he's selling, but I am buying it in Sam's and Costco bulk. Is that all right? Yeah. I want whatever it is that he's got. So the Bible says that there were those who believed. And so that's why we talked about faith from the miraculous family. Uh, is because miracles and signs were manufactured for that purpose. Amen. They are proof. And in a time when someone just shows up and says, I'm the son of God, the easiest thing to say is, yeah, right. And there were many who said that. And so miracles and signs went to prove and to validate and to act as witness of God is and that Jesus is the son of God. This was evidence. This was proof that the power of God was real and that we have access to it. That's why these miracles and these signs we're done. It's inspiration for faith because it shows the power of God, the identity of Christ, the confidence that we can have in God, the hope that we can have in God. It allows us to be converted from evil uh, to, to, to righteousness, from darkness uh, to light, from dead in our sins to saved. Help us increase our faith. But there was a second effect. Because you can also read in verse 46 to 48, watch this. There are those who did not believe. Verse 46 says, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. And this was not a joyous report, family. 
This was them saying, this Jesus that you guys are after, guess what he's done now? We are losing the battle for the hearts and minds of men. He just called a guy from death. The guy is walking around. It's somebody that we know. This is not a trick. This is past the three days. And this Jesus, uh, uh, rabble rouser, that he is, rebel, that he is, maverick, that he is, is doing all kinds of things that's influencing people. What are you guys going to do? That's the kind of report it was. Some believed. Others, as we used to say, ran and told it. And what did those who received the information do? Well, the Bible goes on to say, therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. They acknowledged that he was performing signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. Wonder of wonders. Uh, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Now, let me tell you this real, real quick. The council consisted of the priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. They're all different groups, and I don't have time to break that down for you right now, but I will tell you that this one group of Sadducees, who didn't really believe in resurrection anyway, they were all about being elite. They were all about being in power. They were all about the politics. They were a political party. Uh, the Pharisees, on the other hand, they were just about trying to live the law and live it right and make sure everybody else did. But the Sadducees were about the political power. And they all came together in a council. And so they were very concerned about their position. And so this whole thought process of the Romans coming in and taking us away from our position and taking our nation away from us, that was a Sadducean concern. And that's where this was coming from. So this Jesus, whoever he is and whatever it is he's doing, he's got to go. He's got to go. And so that's what their position was. And they were absolutely invested in making sure that that's what happened. And so let me close with this. The plus and minus effect. The plus and minus effect of this whole thing. We know that in chapter 12 there was a dinner that Jesus had with Mary and with Martha and with Lazarus. People, it had, it had begun to be known far and wide that the resurrection, that, that this, 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 this calling from the dead had taken place. And so then the Bible says the large crowd of the Jews, when they learned that Jesus was there with them having dinner, they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. I want to see it with my own eyes. They must have been from Missouri. Um, <laughs> I've heard about this, but I want to see it for myself. Uh, and, 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 and if I can see this, then, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be willing to believe as well. And so they showed up in Drove's family. Not just to see Jesus, but to see what Jesus had done. To see that the things that they were being told were so. But watch this. The chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death also. So not only do you want to kill off Jesus because you're concerned about your own place, because you're concerned about people believing in him, you want to kill off the man and the miracle. You want to kill off the man and the miracle. I want to get rid of Jesus and the evidence of everything that he has done so we can squash this whole believing that he's the son of God type thing. Why? Because that threatens us in our position. Well, Pharisees and chief priests, aren't you supposed to be leading people to God? And here you are killing God's son and killing all his miracles. You are stomping down everything that you should be lifting up. Family, we've got to look out for that kind of thing. That's right. When there are people who are withstanding the word of God, and when we're out there trying to evangelize and share the good word of God, and then people are critical, and people want to call the police, or people want to say ugly things, what's your motive here? We have to be thoughtful about that kind of thing. But we need to do what we need to do. Because the Bible goes on in verse 11, it says, because on account of him... Many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus because of the miracle, because they can see Lazarus, because they can touch Lazarus, because they know that Lazarus was dead. And now here he is having dinner because of that. They can believe in him. So we've got every reason, family, 
to our relationship with Jesus to believe him and to have faith in him. So listen, when you share, don't worry about the hard hearted. Don't worry about being rejected. Uh, we, we, we know that, that the increase is God's business. Pharaoh had that hard heart and would not turn. Saul also had a hard heart, Paul, and did turn. We just do what it is that we're supposed to. Let the miracle of Jesus' love improve and increase your faith. There's no, you're not going to be able to convince everybody. I mean, just look at the whole mask controversy that's going on. There are some people that's like, you got to wear it, you got to wear it. There's other people that's like, get away from me. You're, you're impinging upon my liberty. I'm not taking a side. I'm just saying, look at the differences in opinions. So there's always going to be people who are going to disagree. Don't worry about that. You do what God has called you to do because of your faith. And let's be the children of God. Right. Let's let our faith guide us because we have all experienced the miracle of Christ, have we not? Right. Amen. 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 And today you can still experience it. Just the word is a miracle in and of itself. And if you have not decided to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, you can today because you've heard his word. It's just believe those things that you've heard. Not because I said them, but because they're written down by the Holy Spirit. By, as, as he influenced men. Understand that we all got sin in our lives. We need to repent of those sins. Stop doing the things that are not consistent with a godly life. Confess Jesus to be your Lord. Take him in. I give you the head of my life. I renounce my own control over my life. And be willing to be baptized for the remission of those sins. Lead a healthy, faithful life until such time as that resurrection day comes. And we are promised the crown of life. You can be a member of the body of Christ today. You can become a Christian today. Simply make your desires known. And we will share with you all that you need to do. In the meantime, let us be strong in our faith, family. Let us continue to seek out the sources of faith that our faith may be increased, enhanced, and improved, that we can act according to that faith. Is that all right? Yes. All right. Amen. As together we stand and we sing. <clears throat> Prayer this morning, we'll pray with you. We'll pray for you.